Well, hello, Impact Church. Can I just take a moment to say welcome to the summertime? We've officially hit summertime now, and so we are heading into a new season. We won't even call it a series, but a new season, Summer at Impact, where we're going to take some time to just take a few weeks to minister to you and just build you up, help to get us anchored in what we're called to do and what our, our mission is, but really just to, to send you through this summer. You know, they talk about a summer slump. I'm prophesying over your life, there won't be a summer slump for you. I'm declaring we're going from glory to glory this summer. Come on, say amen, somebody. And so this summer season is kicking off now with a new, uh, a new teaching today I'm going to start into. But it's kind of setting us up for some of the things that we have coming down the pipe over the course of the summer. A couple of them we mentioned to you already on Saturday, July the 6th. We're asking all of the men and young men to come out to be a part of what we're calling our Man Challenge. It uh, starts at 9.30 a.m. on that Saturday, July the 6th. starts right here with worship and praise for the men. We've got a special message coming from Bishop Rudolph McKissick from the Bethel Church. going to be here ministering with us. And then we're going to head outside, just have a ton of fun, some competitive games, some, some, uh, some, some free throw contests, some 40-yard dash contests. We've got a bench press out there to see who can get their bench press on. And we just, we just uh, secured a 100-foot obstacle course, blow-up obstacle course, to see how many guys can make it through on the other side without needing oxygen. Come on, say amen, somebody. And so we're encouraging all the men and young men to come out. It's free of charge, but we need you to register at weareimpact.com slash challenge to take advantage and participate in that. Then right after that, on uh, uh, Wednesday, July the 10th, we're kicking off what we call Camp Spark. It's kind of like a, a, a vacation Bible school, but so much more than that for our third graders through fifth graders. And it's really designed to do more than just arts and crafts, but to take, help them to gain a heart and appreciation for missions and serving the community. So we're going to do some things here at the ministry where it'll be fun. Then we're going to take them out to a number of projects we have set up for them as third graders, fourth graders, and fifth graders to go out and serve in our community. There's a nominal fee for that, but we, we are so grateful for all of you that give so generously here at Impact because it allows us to offer things like this far below what it actually costs. And we encourage you parents to take advantage of Camp Spark as well. Then we're gearing everybody up. The entire church is moving in the direction of Saturday, July 13th for our serve day. And that's when we're partnering with other churches around the city, other churches across the nation and around the globe to serve our city, to serve our community. We want to do more than just tell the world about the love of God. We want them to see his love in action. And so we've, we put together a number of different projects. You can go to weareimpact.com slash serve day. Find the one that best fits you, best fits your family or your small group. Get all of them signed up and registered to be here with us on July the 13th. That's going to be amazing as well. And then the last thing I want to mention is something that happens toward the end of the summer. Every summer we do a camp or a conference for our students, uh, our middle school students and our high school students, because we just believe it's the, the right way to send them back to school is not just with some new clothes, but with a new spirit a new attitude, a, a new perspective. And so this year we're going to Birmingham, Alabama to participate in what's called the Motion Conference. It is about 15,000 young people that are going to be gathered in the arena there worshiping God, hearing from these amazing speakers, and really just allowing God to do a work on the inside of them. So we've had a tremendous turnout already in registration, but I believe we have about 15 or so more spaces that are still available for those parents that may want to still get in on it. So if you're interested, you can see Pastor Rodney right here on the front row at the end of the service today to be able to get information about that because I promise you the students that go are going to come back radically changed for Jesus. Can I get a good amen in this place today? All right, we're diving into a, a, a teaching today that my goal today is really just to encourage you, to stir you up. If there's somebody that came in here today and you were on the verge of quitting, I promise you, you can cancel those plans. Somebody that came in here today and you were discouraged and you were thinking that things were not going to work out for you, my whole goal for these, the, the remainder of my time today is to help you become convinced of this reality. The Lord is on your side. He is never going to leave you or forsake you. And he's going to see you all the way through to the other side of this victory you're walking in right now. There's a, there's, a, there's a character or a, a personality of Jesus that I think we got to do a better job of embracing and paying attention to. And that is the Bible calls Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith. The Bible says that he is the alpha and he is the omega. It says he is the beginning, he is the end, he is the first and he is the last. In other words, I think God is going overboard to, to, to help us grab this picture that Jesus is not just the one that starts this journey with us. But he's the one that starts it and be, will be here with us every step of the way, all the way to the very end for us to see the full victory that God has in store. That's a good place for you to shout amen right there. Give me a little bit more, Thomas, if you would. 
He'll see us all the way through to the end of this amazing journey that we're on with him. Well, now, you know, if you find yourself in the middle of a fiery furnace, the thing I love about this God, this Jesus that we serve, is that he doesn't just leave us in the furnace and coach us from the sideline. He literally is the one that the Bible describes. He'll get into the fiery furnace with you, and he'll walk with you step by step through your burning fiery furnace. He'll walk with you step by step through your valley of the shadow of death, and he'll stay there with you all the way till you come out on the other side, walking in the victory that God has ordained for your life. So I want to read to you from Psalm number 138. Verse number 7, David is writing. He says, though I walk in the middle of trouble. You ever felt like that? You're walking right in the middle of trouble. I mean, not on the outskirts of trouble, not just kind of, you know, g- g- glancing by trouble. You ever been in one of those seasons where it felt like you were just walking right in the middle of trouble? David says, when I do that, I'm glad to know that you will revive me. In other words, you'll breathe life back into me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. Watch verse number 8. He says, the Lord will perfect. Everybody shout perfect. Perfect. I didn't hear you. Everybody shout perfect. perfect. The Lord will perfect. The word perfect there means he will complete, he will perform, he will bring to an end. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. In other words, the Lord will perfect my healing. He won't just kind of, sort of, just about heal me. He'll perfect my healing. The Lord will perfect my financial recovery, my financial deliverance. The Lord will perfect my family being restored and my, my, my children becoming everything I envisioned them being when I gave birth to them. The Lord's not going to leave me out here by myself for me to just handle it all on my own. The Lord will perfect. He'll bring to a flourishing finish a full end that thing that pertains to me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. And then David says something that all of us have probably said in our hearts. Do not forsake the works of your hands. In other words, don't leave me out here by myself, God. Psalm 138, verse 8 from the New Living Translation. It says, the Lord will work out his plan for my life. Somebody say, the Lord will work it out. Come on, say, the Lord will work it out. Elbow that person next to you and tell them, stop tripping. The Lord will work it out. No, you didn't do what I said. I said, elbow them and tell them, stop tripping. The Lord will work it out. No, you're being too nice. I said, take your elbow, stick it in their rib cage. (laughs) The Lord will work it out, his plan for my life. For your faithful love, O Lord, endures forever. And David said, do not, Lord, abandon me, for you're the one that made me. Hmm? Now, how about this from the Message Bible? Listen to this one. David said, finish what you started in me, God. (laughs) Finish this thing. Wrap this thing up, God. Your love is eternal, so don't quit on me now. David is crying out to God in the very same way that many times we find ourselves crying out to God. In the middle of a difficulty, in the middle of trouble, as David described, David says, I know that you're with me, Lord, and I know you're going to perfect this thing that you started in me, and I'm just asking you, don't quit on me now. Even if I've done something that I feel is worthy of you quitting, I'm asking you, God, for your great mercy, your love's sake, do not quit on me now. Well, despite what our feelings and our circumstances may try to tell us from time to time, there is never a time in our lives, hear me out, where God will ever abandon us, let us down, or quit on us. Now, there are some people in your life that will quit on you. They'll stand at the altar and tell you, I'll be with you to death do us part, or they'll tell you, you're my bestest friend, and we'll be together forever. Sometimes human beings may quit on you, but the promise we have from God, and this is what I want to anchor into your heart today, is that God will never quit on you. He will never abandon you. He will never turn his back and go in the opposite direction, even if you've done something you think is worthy of him leaving you. In fact, the, the, the Bible describes God as being faithful. If you look up the the, the word faithful, he's a faithful guy. If you look up the word faithful, it means strict or thorough in the performance of a duty. It means true to one's word, one's promises, or one's vows. It means reliable or trustworthy. Then I like this last definition. God is faithful. It means he is one who can be depended on. You can count on God. If he tells you something, you can take it to the bank. God will do what he said he would do. I, I found a quote that I think really just fits perfectly, and I think this is, this is just for you. God is the arm that will hold you at your weakest. He is the eye that will see you at your darkest. 
and he is the heart that will love you at your worst. Isn't that good, somebody? <laughs> huh? I mean, he, he, he's the arm. He, he's the one that's right there. He's the arm that will hold you at your weakest moment. He's the eye that won't turn his back, won't turn, turn away from you, but he'll see you at your darkest moment. And God is the heart that will love you at your worst moment, which means no matter what's going on in your life, God will not let you go. In fact, I, I, I'm, I'm thoroughly convinced that God's got us even at times when we don't know that we need him to have us. You know, when I was growing up in the good old Baptist church, anybody come from a good Baptist background like me? About 15 Baptists in the house? Come on. Growing up in the Baptist church, I grew up in the, the, the old saints would stand up and testify, and they'd testify, thank and praise the Lord for, my, for waking me up this morning. Thank and praise the Lord. He woke me up clothing in my right mind. He's, and then they say, I thank and praise the Lord. He's been protecting me from dangers both seen which means that there's stuff that I, I, I could have gotten into. I didn't even know how much trouble I was walking in. But God was right there with me every step of the way. You know, a few weeks ago, I, was, uh, I had to go up to Detroit for a couple business meetings. I had to go up there, and the kids were out of school. So since they were out of school, we bought tickets for them to, to take them with us to Detroit, let them see some family and spend some time up there while we were there. And uh, I like to direct flights, especially when you're traveling with kids. How many of you know the devil is into connecting flights when you're flying with kids? <laughs> So we had a direct flight. What only direct flight that can get us up there without giving away the whole day was at like 6.30 in the morning. How many of those 6.30 a.m. flights are also of the devil? <laughs> so, you know, to, 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 get to, to get on a 6.30 a.m. flight, you got to be there at least by 5.30. And I'm that guy. I like to be at the airport two hours ahead of time. I like to take my time getting to the airport. I don't like rushing. I like to park my car and be able to stroll through. I don't like flying through and, and, and cussing in my mind all the way there and all that kind of stuff. So to get to the airport by at least 5 o'clock, you know, 4.45, we had to leave our house at like 4 o'clock in the morning, 4.15. When I leave the house at 4.15, how I many of you got to get up at 3.30, 3.15? You get where I'm going. So by the time we get up to leave the house, I mean, we're, we're leaving, but everybody's a little delirious. And so, you know, Daryl Marshall came to pick us up to get us to the airport that early in the morning. And, and as we get to the airport, you know, we all get out, get our bags, get checked in, and get our bags to, to, the, to the baggage people. So we're now going through the... Secu towards security line, and if you haven't been to JIA lately, man, when you get there at 6 in the morning, there's a line to, to check in that's like two and a half miles long. But thankfully, we all have TSA pre-check, pre so we felt like boss is kind of walking past the rest of the line. <laughs> it went right up to the front, probably six or seven people in line where we were, showed them our ID, and they checked us off, and we're in line now to go through the, the, the little screening belt. You know, you put your bags on the belt. Well, when you got TSA pre-check, you don't have to take your shoes off. You don't have to take your laptop off your bag. You just put your bag on there, they, they roll it through. Well, now, I got a little routine when I get to the airport. When, I, when I'm getting ready to go through security, I take my wallet out, take my phone out, all my, 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 my AirPods, and I put them in one particular pocket in my bag, zip it up, and I get to the other side, I take it all out. I do it every time I travel. It's this routine. Well, this particular time, I'm getting ready to put my, my bag up there, and, and, and you got to understand, I... I, I carry a weapon. I have a concealed weapon permit. And I've, I've had it for years. I have legal. Uh, if you don't think I should have a concealed weapon permit, pray for me. <laughs> but as of right now, I have a concealed weapon permit. And, and I have, I've carried a weapon now for 25 years. So I understand, I understand how to handle it safe. Well, let me say this. I've legally carried a weapon now for 25 years. <laughs> legally. <laughs> And so, I mean, I'm, I'm real safety conscious and all that. But again, I'm leaving early in the morning. I'm delirious. Well, apparently the night before when I got home, I normally clear my bag. If it's in my bag, I clear my bag, put it into the safe before I hit my head down. Obviously, I didn't do that the night before. And so I get to the airport. And I'm getting ready to put my bag on the, on the conveyor belt to go through to the security screening. And something told me. <laughs> Anybody thank God for something telling you? Just, I, I open, I zip, I unzipped the, the, the one, one zipper that I never unzip when I'm getting ready to go through security. But I stuck my hand in there, and when I stuck my hand in there, all I can say is, oh, Lord, baby Jesus. Because <laughs> now I'm standing there, and I got a dilemma. I can't let the bag go on through security, or I'm going to jail today. I can't even make a big deal out of it. So I just kind of slowly pulled my hand back out, zipped my bag up, and I said to my wife, uh, sweetheart, my bag is hot. So I'm going to head to the car. <laughs> and then one of my kids, I'm not going to say which one of them, they said, you got your weapon? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want to say, be quiet, boy. <laughs> so I casually head back out of line, head back outside, call Daryl. He's got to turn around, come back up there. 
I wait for him to get there and then able to make the exchange so I can head on out. But how many know I was thanking God for protecting me from danger seen and unseen? Come on, you ought to be celebrating with me because I wouldn't have been here to preach to you today. <laughs> How about 2 Thessalonians? Paul understands this. He says, finally, dear brethren, as I come to the end of this letter, I'm asking you to pray for us. There's nothing wrong with asking somebody to pray for you. We all need prayer. He said, pray first of all that the Lord's message will spread rapidly and that it'll triumph. It'll be victorious everywhere that it goes. Winning converts everywhere just like it did when it came to you. He said, but also pray that we will be saved out of the clutches of evil men, for not everyone loves the Lord. In other words, Paul said, everybody ain't saved. And so Paul said, pray for us that we can be saved, we can be delivered out of the clutches of evil men. He said, but the Lord is what? Come on, I can't hear you. The Lord is what? Come on, I can't hear you. The Lord is what? He is faithful. He will make you strong. And the Lord will guard you, watch this, from satanic attacks of every kind. He said, when you got crazy people coming against you, folks not liking you for no good reason, people hating on you for nothing, you've done nothing wrong to them, and they just make a decision they're not going to like you. He said, stop trying to go tit for tat with them. Stop feeling like you got to be the defender of yourself. You got to protect yourself. You got to set everybody straight. You got to fix every situation. He says, start putting your trust in the one who promised that he would protect you, that he would, he would keep you, he would deliver you out of the clutches of evil men, he'll make you strong, and he will guard you against satanic attacks of every kind. And I'm here to tell you, if you are going to be a leader of any kind in any situation, there are going to be some satanic attacks that come your way. That's why you got to make up your mind, man. Everybody wants to be a leader until the bullets start flying at them. Everybody wants to be a leader up front on the stage with some responsibility until the attacks start to come. If you are in a position of leadership, you can just take it to the bank. The enemy is going to constantly be trying to take you out. In fact, I wrote a book about six years ago called Passing the Test of Life. I think we, have it in our, we should have it in our bookstore over there. I recommend it, not because I wrote it, but because it really is a, a guidebook that will help you to understand whatever you're going through right now in life. Because every one of us goes through different types of tests that we have to pass. And it's not that God is testing us. God doesn't need to test us. He knows what we'll do in every situation. But how many know life will sometimes test us? And when life throws a test our way, God, heaven needs to see that we will react the right way if we want to get promoted in the kingdom of God. Kind of like going from fourth grade to fifth grade. You've got you to pass the assignments in fourth grade if you want to make it to fifth grade. Well, there's one test that I, that I have added, a couple of tests actually I've added. I'm actually praying about considering doing a, a second edition of this book because there's a couple of tests that have come to me since I finished it, and one of them is a test that I'm calling the target test. And the target test is, is this. It's, it's, it's a question where you have to ask yourself, can you live with an unfair bullseye on your back and not respond to every attack from the enemy? If you live, can you live with an unfair, I don't mean it's, it's deserved bullseye, but with an unfair bullseye on your back and not end up having to respond to every attack from the enemy? Can you resist the urge to constantly attack back and fight back or lose heart and be ready to give up and quit at the first sign of trouble all the time? See, there's a difference between how God is used, will use a leader versus somebody that's just coming in in the rank and file. And I can tell you, if you're part of this church, you are part of leadership ranks, man. God has called you to be a leader. Whether it's in the church, on your job, you are called to be a leader. Come on, say amen, somebody. And when you're called to be a leader, you got to be willing to handle the stuff that comes your way and not be ready to fight every time somebody attacks you and not be ready to throw in the towel and give up every time you get an attack that comes against you. In fact, when Paul was writing to a young pastor by the name of Timothy, he's telling Timothy what the qualifications are to be a, a overseer. The King James says to be a bishop. But when we think of bishop, we think of somebody in my role who's, who's over a church, who's over multiple churches with a, with a title in front of your name. But all he's really saying is these are the qualifications if you want to be a significant leader in the church. So that's a pastor. That's an evangelist. That's a small group leader. That's a department leader in the church. If you want to be somebody that God can trust to oversee other people, there's some qualifications. And one of the things that he says in 1 Timothy 3.3 is that that man or woman must not be a heavy drinker or be violent. That man or woman must be gentle, watch this, 
not quarrelsome, and not love money. In other words, if you want to be somebody who God can trust you to be up in front of people to lead other folks, you can't be ready to fight at the first sign of trouble every time. Thank you for those two amens. I really appreciate it. You can't be ready to fight. You can't be ready to respond to everything somebody posts on your Facebook page and got to, got to straighten it out, got to tell them off. And you can't be ready to go over to somebody's house and I'm going to give them a piece of mind. You cannot be what the Bible says is quarrelsome. You cannot be easily offended if you're going to be in a position of leadership. Listen to this. So often people disqualify themselves from God using them in a greater capacity because they can't let stuff go and they can't forget something that they heard. How many times is God ready to use somebody and promote them? And you, 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 you've seen in a dream yourself standing up preaching to thousands of people or on the stage singing in front of the masses or you know that God gave you the ability to write songs or you got this dream in your heart to open this business, but God can't trust you with it because if he trusts you with it and your customers come in and they offend you, you're going to be too concerned about standing your ground and holding your rights instead of recognizing that even when your customer is wrong, most of the time they're still right. I'm preaching better than you saying amen. And so consequently, sometimes we end up in this frustrated place because we're ready for God to promote us, but God can't promote us because he knows if I promote you and I put you on a higher stage, it just means you got a bigger target on you. And if your natural reaction is i got to fight back, then God's not going to put you in a position where every time somebody comes at you, you got to turn around and feel like you got to fight every single time somebody says something you don't like. This is one of the reasons why I honestly growing up said I would never be a pastor. My mother's here on the second row. She'll tell you, I did not have the nice pastor personality. And it still takes work for me. You know, I mean, some, some guys, are like, I think like Joe Lowstein, he gets up in the morning, he's just nice. I mean, I, I, I think he, he just not, I mean, that was not my baseline personality. My baseline personality, without the help of the Holy Spirit, a good wife, and, and a belief in the legal system, my baseline personality, if you smack me, I'm going to smack you back. We can pray afterwards. We can talk about it afterwards. But I, I have never, I have just never been the type to just sit back and just take stuff like that. And so, even growing up, I just, I was never wired that way. So, I always vowed growing up I would never be a pastor, man. My dad, my dad growing up was a deacon in the church. Then he became an associate pastor in the church, which, which means, you know, he was, he's helped out on the weekends. And I just remember some of the things that, that he would do. He would drive folks home. I mean, after church was over, we would take loads of people home, come back to church, get more people, drive them home again. I saw him take food to people. I saw my parents help people in the hospital, visit them. And I saw a lot of the very same people that they did all those things for turn around and talk about them like dirty dogs. So growing up, I was like, oh, that, that can't be me. I, I'm not wired like that. And lo and behold, God calls me to ministry. Amen. And even when he first called me to ministry, I still didn't have the personality for it. I, I have, so, some people struggle with alcohol. Some people struggle with this. My struggle was with anger. And I, would, I had a set it off button that could go from zero to 100 quickly. And the way in which it changed in me, you say, how did it change? It didn't change because, like I say, I was already saved and still had an anger problem. What changed is when I got to Word of Faith and I started being taught the Word of God, I realized that's how I'm acting, but that's not who I am. Can, can I help somebody in here? That, that's what I'm doing, but that's not really who I am. And so often we get stuck on thinking that our feelings or our, our emotions or our affections or the way we're, 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 we're feeling at the moment is who we are. Who we are is who God said we are. So when I found out in, 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 in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that it gives a description of what love is, and I found out that God is love, and I was made in his image and after his likeness, I put two and two together. If God is love and I'm made just like him, then I'm really love too. So I got me an Amplified Bible, and I started reading 1 Corinthians 13 from the Amplified Bible. And it said something like this. that love endures long. Love is patient and kind. Love never is envious. It doesn't boil over with jealousy. It takes no account of the evil done to it. Love pays no attention to it, suffer wrong. And it goes on and on. It doesn't, it doesn't rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness. Love rejoices when right and truth prevail. And when I realize that if that's love and God is love and I'm just like God, then that's me too. So I did this for like three years. Every day I would get up and I would read that chapter. And instead of saying love, I put my name in there. I say, George endures long and he's patient and kind. All the while I'm ready to fight somebody. George never is envious. He doesn't boil over with jealousy. 
He's not deceitful and he's not full of vain glory. He doesn't pay any attention to a suffered wrong. He takes no account of the evil done to him. And at first it was just words coming out of my mouth, but after a while I start confessing it and my personality starts transforming to line up with who God really said that I am. I'm teaching you a good lesson right here. Don't just settle for letting yourself be mean and honorary and full of this deception and, and full of, of vain glory and, and counting up every time somebody's done you wrong, start allowing the Word of God to transform you. I started confessing what God said about me and started praying in the Holy Spirit on a consistent basis. Before I know it, God started changing me from the inside out enough to where he could then trust me to turn around and put me in front of a congregation of people. I've been pastoring this church for 23 years. I have never slapped anybody in 23 years. And I never will. Come on, somebody. Unless you slap me first. Come on. <laughs> huh? Why? Because God has changed me, man. He's transformed. I won't even say he's changed me. He's helped me to become who he really made me to be. Can I get a good amen from somebody? I said, can I get an amen from somebody? How about Hebrews 13 verse 5 says, don't be obsessed with getting more material things. Be relaxed with what you have since God has assured us, I will never let you down. And I will never walk off and leave you. Man, that's good. God says, no matter what you do, I'm, I'm not going to walk off and leave you. I'm, I'm not going to let you down. That means he's never failed us, even the times when we felt like he failed us. And I've been pastoring long enough to have encountered lots of people who lived their entire life thinking that God failed them. They had a child that passed away, and that's one of the worst things that could ever happen to a parent. I've never had it happen to me, thank God, but I, I can't imagine. I, I've helped lots of families through it. I can't imagine a pain more dramatic than the pain of having to bury your child. Parents aren't supposed to bury your kids. Your kids are supposed to bury you. But I've seen situations like that. And, in fact, I was, I was just uh, at, a, at, a, at a home going not that long ago where I stood up and ministered at the funeral home. And when I got done, I came out. And this lady stopped me. She said, I don't go to your church. She said, but I need, I've, been, I've been hoping I would run into you. She said, because you ministered a message years ago, and somebody gave me a, 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 a CD of you ministering. And you talked about hope beyond the grave and, and how God, it wasn't God's plan for your child to die. And she said, I have been living bitter and angry at God for years until you opened up my eyes through that revelation. And I believe there may be somebody sitting here today as well. You've been living your life angry at God. You think it's God's fault that your kid passed away. And maybe somebody said that God needed a flower in heaven so he plucked your child out. It wasn't God that hurt you, sweetheart. It wasn't God that took your mother away. It wasn't God that caused your grandmother to leave you right when you needed her the most. It wasn't God that caused your, your dad to become so selfish that he packed up and walked away from the family and left you to become a man way too soon. But it is God that has been with you every step of the way. It is God that has kept you from losing your mind. Come on, help me out, somebody. It is God that has promised that when everybody else has walked away from you, you can count on this reality. I will be there with you every step of the way. So don't turn your anger toward God. Turn your love toward heaven and watch God pick you up from where you are to make a miracle out of the mess that somebody else left you in. Come on, say amen, somebody. I said, come on, say amen, somebody. Many times we assume that, yeah, God's not going to leave me and he's not going to leave me because he loves me. That is true. But can I tell you, he also won't leave you because his name is on you. He's not going to leave you. Yes, he, he does love us. But he also is not going to leave us because his name is resting on us. 1 Samuel chapter, 20, chapter 12, verse 22. It says, for the Lord will not forsake his people. Watch this. For his great name's sake. Because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. God says, I'm not going to leave you because somebody knows you belong to me. My name is on you, man. Somebody has seen your screensaver at work. Saying that the wind is at your back and the Lord is on your side. Somebody has seen that, that bumper sticker on the back of your, your car that says Impact Church. Somebody has seen those praying hands or those crosses and they've seen you praying over your food at work. They know that the name of God is resting on you. So God says, not only am I not going to leave you because I love you, I'm not going to leave you because somebody knows you are mine. My, my name is on the line for you. Kind of like when, when in Numbers chapter 13 when God sent Israel the spies into the promised land. Ten of the spies came back, and all they could talk about was how many giants were there. Joshua and Caleb came back, and they said, let's go up right now. We can take this land. The ten spies had such a bad report that they turned all of Israel's heart. The, all the, the, the adults in Israel said, we can't do this. It's too much. In fact, they said, God, you brought us out here in the wilderness to kill our kids. God got fed up with him. He said, you know what? I'm done. I'm done play, playing games with you all. He said, Moses, come here. I'm going to take you and start all over. I'm going to make a brand new nation out of you. 
And the Bible says Moses interceded for Israel. Moses went to God in prayer. He said, I'm paraphrasing. He said, well, God, hang on a second. He said, all those nations that saw you bring us out of Egypt and that saw you bring us through the Red Sea, if you kill all these people like one man at one time, then all those nations that saw you bring us out, they're going to say, well, because he wasn't strong enough to take them into the promised land, he killed them out here in the wilderness. I'm paraphrasing. God said, they're going to say what? In other words, I can't have my name being talked about in these streets. I can't have pe people thinking I'm a, 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 a deadbeat dad that will abandon my kids. So God pardoned their sin, took their kids into the promised land. Why? Because his name was on them. Well, his name is on you too. Just like this, my, my mother growing up as a single parent, her name was on me and my brother. And I remember one day, man, my, my brother always had a habit of just wanting to get up and put on anything to head outside on a Saturday morning. And, and, and now I understand because it's his creativity. He's the most creative guy I know on planet Earth. Just God just gives him ideas. When I need a creative idea, I call him, tell him what I'm thinking. He'll spit something back out at me. Well, he's been that way since he was a little kid. And I remember a Saturday morning he got up. It was in the middle of the summer. He put on some brown corduroy pants. <laughs> corduroy in the middle of the summer. Some cowboy boots. He put on a yellow long, long sleeve turtleneck shirt. He had on a cowboy vest, put on his cowboy hat and his little cowboy holster. And came and shook my mama Saturday morning and said, I'm getting ready to go outside. She rode over and looked at him. He said, you ain't going nowhere looking like that. She said, because somebody out there knows you belong to me. <laughs> God's not about to let his name be put to shame thinking that he doesn't know how to come through for his kids. Come on, you better believe God's going to come through for you. I'm preaching to somebody in here right now. I said, you better believe God's going to come through for you, not just because he loves you. God needs to set a table before you in the presence of your enemies so that every one of your enemies knows that your God is the God who knows how to provide. Come on, your God is the God who knows how to heal. Your God is the God who knows how to deliver. Your God is the God who knows how to promote. Your God is the God who knows how to go past what somebody else said was a no and turn their no into a supernatural yes. Your God is the God that when they say it's incurable, he says, watch me heal what you said cannot be healed. But he needs for you to grab hold of some faith and some expectation and know that God will never let you down. So many times when we get stuck in a difficult spot, we lose all of our senses and we just start hoping for the pressure to be off. That's why we have to watch when you get under pressure. Don't just take off and go add another job when you haven't prayed about that. Don't take off and just move to another city. You haven't even considered what your spiritual life. It frustrates me to no end when somebody packs up, moves to another city to take a job making, you know, $20,000 more per year but haven't even considered what their spiritual life is like. Then they're already there settled in and messing me, asking me, do you know of a church there? That should have been the first question. That should, before you ever even moved, that should have been the first question. But the, it's always that panic, man. Because you, know, you know how it is when you get in the middle of a financial crisis, you get in the middle of a bad doctor's report, you have your kid do something that's way out of character, and you start to panic, and then, then the devil starts sitting on your shoulder and says, this is it right here, this is going to take you out. Then your mind starts telling you that you're in the middle of a Fred Sanford challenge. You know what a Fred Sanford trouble is? Huh? Remember, anybody ever watched Fred Sanford growing up? Anybody ever watched Fred Sanford reruns? Anybody ever heard the name Fred Sanford? <laughs> huh? Red Fox, Fred G. Sanford, Sanford the Son. I mean, every week, if you watch Sanford the Son, I mean, every week he would end up in trouble, and every week it was the big one. <laughs> every week is Elizabeth, I'm, I'm coming to join you. <laughs> but isn't that how we, how we act sometimes? God has brought you through this same thing four different times, but this time it showed up. It's the big one this time. This time, God's not going to be able to turn my kid around. Well, he turned your kid around before. He got you out of that financial situation before. Come on, talk to me, somebody. And see, part of the problem is when he brings us out, we don't take enough time to praise him like we should. And because we don't take enough time to praise him like we should, we forget the first time something else shows up. Well, I'm going to tell you, when God has been good to you, you need to praise him like he's been good. Come on, you ought to take a moment right now to celebrate him like he's been good. Come on, you ought to shout like he's been good. Come on, you ought to rejoice like he's been good. You ought to thank him like he's been good. You ought to have some expectation if he did it before. He's the same God. He'll do the same exact thing again.
Amen. I said, amen. amen. How about what he said in 1 Corinthians 10, 13? He says, no test or temptation comes your way that is beyond the course of what others have had to face. In other words, whatever you're going through, it's not the end of the world. Somebody else has dealt with it too. All you need to remember is that God will never let you down. He'll never let you be pushed. Watch this. Past your limit. Stop saying I can't take it anymore. He'll never let you get pushed past your limit. But he'll always be there to help you come through. Listen to this quote the Lord gave me this years ago. God will never let you be pushed past your limit, but he will allow you to get pushed past your comfort zone. And sometimes when it feels like I can't take it anymore, what we're really saying is I'm out of my comfort zone. So often we get used to God rescuing us so immediately that when God slows, slows down, he, he, he steps back. He, he never leaves us, but sometimes God will sit back and let you go. Well, you know how to handle this. I put enough word on the inside of you. You know what to do here. You've been coming to this church long enough. You've heard enough sermons now. You've heard enough words. You know how to operate your faith. You know what to do in this. And when God doesn't step in and rescue us immediately, that's when sometimes we reach up and push the panic button. And what, really, what God is really doing in most of those cases, can I just say, is he's sending a signal to us that it's time to grow up. It's time to stop identifying as the woman with the issue of blood that's, that's trying to make her way to Jesus' garment. It's time to grow up and realize that God's ready to use you as the one that's got on the garment. So he can send somebody else to you for you to pray for them. Come on, talk to me, somebody. And when God puts you in grow-up mode, what happens when you're in grow-up mode, he never leaves you, but he also doesn't step in and rescue you immediately because he's trying to let you work out that salvation. He's trying to let you work through all that word and all those nine steps you wrote down and all those notebooks you filled up. He's trying to give you a chance to do some of that stuff you've been taught. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Amen. amen. I said, amen. amen. I said, amen. amen. Lastly, Isaiah 43. He says, but now this is what the Lord is saying to you. The one that created you, oh, Jacob, you can put your name in there. The one that created you, oh, Ermin. The one that created you, Rodney. The one that created you, Janet. The one that formed you, oh, Israel. This is what God is saying, stop being afraid because I redeemed you. I've called you by your name. Watch this. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will what? Come on, I will what? When you pass through the rivers, they shall not what? When you walk through the fire, you shall what? Not be burned, nor shall the flame burn. Scorch you. <laughs> when you go through the water, he said, I'll be with you. When you go through the river, though, it won't come over your head. <laughs> Might get up to your neck, but it won't overflow you. You go through the fire. I know it's scary all around you, but if you trust me, it won't, it won't burn you. you know, I can't tell you how many times I've taught this in 26 years of ministry. I was studying this this week, riding in, and something hit me. <laughs> If he's with me through the water, why don't he just park the water then? If he's with me in the river, why don't he just dry the river up? If he's right there next to me as I'm going through the fire, why don't he blow the fire out then? And I believe the answer I got in my spirit was this. Because God needs for us to mature to a place where we know that the one who is with us is strong enough, watch this, to see us through the difficult times that come against us. Every one of us wants to pray a prayer today and by this afternoon have the problem go away. But God needs us to know even when it doesn't go away immediately, I can take you through it and cause you to come out on the other side without having the smell of smoke on your clothes. When the children of Israel... We're being led out of Egypt by Moses. They're a group of slaves that have been slaves now for 400 years. They're finally liberated. Pharaoh lets them go. Then he changes his mind. So they get to the bank of the Red Sea, and Pharaoh's army is behind them. They got the Red Sea in front of them. They're crying out to God, what, what's going on here? You remember the story. Moses stretches out his rod, and waters open up. Everybody passes through. Oh, praise the Lord. He's been good to us. Hallelujah. Fast forward 40 years later. 
Joshua's leading them now. Get to another spot, the Jordan River. It's swollen over. The waters are raging, and they need to get through again. Well, you'd expect it. All they got to do is find you a stick and stick it out there, and it'll open up. But God's not going to let that happen again. This time, God said, I'll open the water, but you're going to have to trust me more than you did last time. He said, this time I'll open the water, but I'm going to wait until the priests put the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulder. When their feet get into the water, then watch and see what I'll do. I'll open the waters up. Can you imagine you the priest at the front, not in the back? You're at the front. You, you, you mean? And you're walking in, water's up to your calves, water's up to your knee because you're waiting on the last guy to get into the water too. When all of us are in the water, I'm going to imagine maybe the water's up to his chest and it's raging like it could wash him on down stream. By the time the last guy's feet hit the water, the waters open up. What am I saying? God's going to do for you this time the same thing he did for you last time. But he's going to require more out of you this time than he required out of you last time. He's not, he's not forsaking you, but he's going to require you to praise him a little bit more than you did last time. Get your nose in his word a little bit more than you did last time. Cast down some thoughts a little more than you did last time. Stand still, see the salvation of the Lord, and watch God deliver you just like he did before. Amen. I said this at the earlier service, and I, and I sense it right here as well. There's something powerful that's going to happen in your life this week. If you will release a praise into the atmosphere that is stronger than a praise you've released in a long time. And if I were you, I'd go ahead and get up and get started with it right now. I'd stand on my feet and go ahead and begin praising God right now. Come on, go ahead and release that praise into the atmosphere. Come on, open up your mouth and bless the Lord. Come on, release a praise. Come on, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Come on, release a praise today. We bless your name, oh God. Come on, we bless your name, oh God. Come on, we praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. Hallowed be your name, oh God. Say this out loud. Say, dear God in heaven, I believe today your word is working for me. I believe today your word is working for me. So I declare my body is healed from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. All of my organs, all of my tissues, all of my bones, my blood vessels, they are functioning perfectly. And I refuse to accept anything less. I'm not healed because I feel like it. I'm healed because you said it. And I believe it right now. I declare you supply every need in my life according to your word. And so I trust you for that. I declare every need is met. I have given. It's given unto me. Good measure. Pressed down. Shaken together. Running over. Men give to me because I've been generous to give it out. So I declare I have every need met. And I've got a whole lot more to put in store. I declare for me and my house, we are safe. We are protected. We are covered by the blood of Jesus. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. We put our trust in God. And it all works out because of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Now, if you believe that, give the Lord a shout of thanksgiving. Come on, impact. Give the Lord a shout of this place. Yeah. We believe you, Lord. We believe you, Lord. We believe you, Lord. We believe you, Lord. Praise God. Now look up here at me for just a moment. I want to just take this moment to ask you a real important question. If you were to walk out of here right now and your feet hit the pavement out here in the parking lot, do you know where you'd go? I know everybody says, well, I'll get myself together. I'll wait till next time. There's no guarantee that there'll ever be a next time without Jesus. There's a reason why somebody invited you to be here today in this moment. It's because God loves you so much. He wanted to give you a chance to hear that God's not mad at you.
He's not waiting on you to promise that you'll stop doing these five things before he'll save you, make you brand new. There's really only one thing he wants you to promise. That is promise that you will surrender your whole life to him for the rest of your days. And on the heels of that one promise, he'll take you by the hand. And anything he wants you to fix or change, he'll work with you to get it right. But he'll love you all the way through it. Don't let the enemy make you think that you're not good enough to come to Christ. None of us were good enough. He made us righteous. But there's a part we have to play in it. God makes his move by sending Jesus. We've got to make our move by making a decision to surrender our heart and our life to him. So I want to ask you, ma'am, sir, young person, would you please give me a chance right now to pray for you if you're not saved? If you don't know for sure that you go to heaven to be with the Lord, let me pray for you today. I'm not going to ask you to come up here to the front of the church right there where you are. I'm going to lead you in a prayer that will change your life forever if you give me a chance to do so. Every head is now bowed. All eyes are closed. If you say, yes, pastor, include me in on this prayer. And let me know right now that I'm praying for you by lifting up your hand right there where you are. Lift up real high. Thank you. See that hand there? Another hand there. Another hand there. Beautiful. Another hand there. Another hand right there. Another hand there. See the hand there. Another one there. One, two hands there. Thank you. Another hand there. Beautiful. Another hand there. Thank you, sir. Another hand there. One more there. Another one there. Beautiful. All over the building. Hands are going up. Thank you, ushers. Thank you. Thank you for the hands. Several hands in our overflow room over there. Come on. Who else today? Who else? All over the room. Hands are up. Thank you. Thank you. Another hand there. Beautiful. 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 Anybody online that I'm talking to right now? I can't see you, but you can see me. Even if you're on, the, on Facebook or on our live stream, right there in the little chat box, just, just use the hand emoji or type the word hand. We have a minister that's right there. We'll, we'll help you out and give you the instructions you need afterwards as well. But God will meet you right there at your point of need. All right, every one of you that raised your hand for prayer, can I get you to just pray this prayer just loud enough for you and God to hear? And God's going to meet you right there at your seat. Say this out loud. Say, dear God in heaven, Thank you for loving me today. I do believe with all of my heart that Jesus is your son. He died and paid the price for my sin. But you raised him from the dead, and he's alive right now. So Jesus, come into my heart now. Save me now. Forgive me for trying to live this life without you. I confess you as my Lord, and I surrender my whole heart to you forever. According to the Bible, I am right now born again. Amen. Impact Church, help me celebrate these new family members.